Hi folks, Matt Easton here for Scholar Gladiatoria channel. I'm here with Tobias Capwell again uh, at the Wallace Collection. Uh, Toby is curator of Arms and Armour here and we're talking about the upcoming um, Battle of Agincourt exhibition uh, and we're actually looking at two original helmets from that period here. So this helmet almost doesn't need any introductions, does it Toby? Because it's been in uh, countless uh, books on Arms and Armour, hasn't it? Over it is. It's, I mean, there, there are a few of these visor bassinets surviving around in, in different museum collections, but uh, this is one of the, the, the more widely published and more famous ones, certainly. And, and yeah, it's, it's one of the great icons of the Wells Collection. Uh, right alongside, uh, you know, the Rembrandts and the and, and the other masterpieces, and um, it's an extraordinary example, I think, of about how a, you know a very strong aesthetic, a very strong sculptural form, uh, grows out of pure function. You know, these people needed to design a helmet that would deflect arrows and crossbow bolts and other missiles away from the face as effectively as possible at a time when you know, archers were being deployed in, in mass numbers by the English, certainly against the French. But you know, crossbowmen in many situations were a serious threat as well. Um, so they've come up with this form for purely practical reasons, but it's taken on an extraordinarily iconic aspect. Uh, the human brain can't fail but to make a face wherever it sees one. And these just, this is one of the great images of the Hundred Years' War period. You know, when you think of this period in history, that helmet form is just inevitably something that should, should come to your mind. And it's such a, it's such a strong shape. Um, it's, it, it, you see it in, you know, films like Excalibur even mm -hmm. use this type of helmet mm -hmm. on a far later period mm -hmm. type of armour because it's almost like people know what that helmet looks like and they want to see that helmet on other suits of armour even mm -hmm. when it doesn't match. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, I mean, as a, as a helmet designer, it was hugely um, successful, wasn't it? I mean, from about, what, 1360-ish, mm -hmm. um, right the way through to about, what, 1420, I guess you probably... Yeah, I think you, you could probably push it even farther than that if you mm -hmm. account for, you know, the older-fashioned armour continuing to be worn as long as it, you know, did somebody some use. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, 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 I don't think you would have expected to see them any earlier than the 1360s. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, they still appear in art in the 1430s, 1440s. There are, there are English inventories of the 1450s that mention bassinets of old fashion still being in the local armories and things. So they, they, their effectiveness is implied by their very long lifetime. And they do occasionally turn up in later paintings, don't they? I, can, um, I can't remember the artist, but there's a 16th century painting where one of the sort oh, of guards... Oh, there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of in, in uh, uh, early German Renaissance yeah. painting, uh, Hans Holbein the yeah. Elder yeah. often puts them in altarpieces and things mm. because they're so iconic, they're so distinctive that they bolt themselves onto the times in which they were made. Mm -hmm. So someone in the 16th century immediately recognizes this as old-fashioned and from another time. And if an artist wants to evoke some other more ancient time, mm -hmm. he can pick up on something like that and it's, imme it's you know, an immediate currency. It's like us using a steam train or an E-type Jaguar in, in a scene to right. give it that, that right. Right. sort of heritage. Yeah. Yeah. Although, I imagine that the skull of this bassinet might be slightly older um, based on these two rivets. Do you want to tell us about this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is significantly older. Um, the, uh, they, they've got, there's, there's, a riv there's a rivet hole there and there's also one there that's been filled with a, with a flush ground rivet so it doesn't interfere with the visor. There are actually two uh, holes right there, right in the place where you would need two holes for the uh, attachment system of the so-called clap visor, uh, the centrally pivoted uh, bassinet visor of the mm. earlier period. So it has a hinge um, in the central. It has a hinge in the central and just yeah. kind of straight yeah. up like that. Um, and you've and seen those on effigies in the sort of 1330s, 1340s, up to the 50s, don't you, I think? Well, they, I mean, they, they are current right up until the late 14th century yes, in yeah. Italy and Germany. Yeah. Yeah, particularly um, in Germany, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but the, I mean, the Italians were under German, there were a lot of German mm -hmm. mercenaries fighting in Italy in the 14th century, so you see a lot of uh, Germanic equipment spilling over into mm -hmm. Italy as well. And German fencing um, masters as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this originally had one of those centrally pivoted clap visors. 
uh, but it's a good, thick skull, well made, inevitably has a long working lifetime, and at some point it, was, uh, it had a visor of the new form mounted to it. Now, this visor probably dates from um, no earlier than about 1380, and it could be as late as you know, 1400, 1410, 1415 even. Um, so this could have been a Tajinkov. Well, it's, cer <laughs> it's certainly the it sort of thing. Could have been, yeah. It's yeah. The, certainly the sort of thing that was being worn in large numbers at Agincourt on both sides. Um, this visor is very, very closely related and has, it may have a common pedigree with a series of helmets that are still in France, most of them at the Musée de l'Armée in Paris. Mm. And I wonder whether they all come from a common old French um, uh, source. Collection. Uh, but it's, uh, at the moment it's hard, it's hard to say more than that. Um, what is also hard to say is whether the marriage of this visor and this skull uh, is something that dates from the working lifetime of the helmet but it could have been done in the 19th century. It's an original visor, it's original skull, but the, but the marriage could have been done in the 19th century um, or any time before that, so we can't, be, we can't be entirely sure about that. It doesn't fit that well, um, but it would still work. You could still use it, so... But it does, it does fit, yeah, and, and it and, is functional. And the male, the male is, was added in the 20th century. Uh, the male is trying to, to replicate the, the aventails worn with these type of elements. Mm -hmm. it's, it's of the wrong construction and it's, bit, it's fragments of male pieced together. Uh, but it's now part of the story of the object and, so and the, it gives you a sense of what's supposed to be there. So the, the aventail um, skirt, for want of a better term, that sits around or links to the bottom of the helmet here, mm -hmm. that originally, uh, well if this isn't an original one, but an original aventail would have had padding underneath yep, it? And, yep. and usually I think they were laced to or pointed to the padding underneath. They can be, but the main thing is to have a, quite a stiff lining underneath yeah, them. Yeah. That's, that is absolutely part of, part of their job. And the and male... gives this shape, doesn't it? Yeah, it gives this very distinctive shape yeah. and you often see on, on, on better depictions mm -hmm. that the male curls under at the bottom and if you line an aventail and, and you move the, the male around, you can see it curl up. It does that naturally. Right. So that whenever you see that male curling up at the bottom, it's a dead giveaway that there's right. a lining. Um, but the, and also the type of male used on aventails is another important consideration. Male is not just male. You know, male can be a very different material depending on the type of links. The size of the link, uh, the, the weight of the link, the density of the weave, uh, you can have anything from a very light metal fabric, which really just protects you against blades and you know laceration, to very heavy, very dense mail that'll stop arrows. Uh, and the the, the aventails and bassinets, the, the few originals that survive, tend to be small, heavy links, with, you know, leading to a very dense weave, and you know, pretty good protection against uh, against arrows just as much as the plate element. Certainly with a thick lining. Still giving you enough yeah. flexibility that you can turn your head more. It's, it's quite an, a difficult area of the body to protect with plate. And so mm -hmm. obviously what comes after this is the so-called great bassinet. Mm -hmm. um, and it took them a bit of time really, didn't it, to work out how to get a gorget to interact yeah. with it. It's yeah. a more complex yeah. thing. So this is a simple, clean solution mm -hmm. to, to that problem. If, if all of these designs are trying to balance protection with mobility. And those two things are inversely proportional. You increase your protection, you lose on your mobility. You increase your mobility, you lose on your protection. There's no way that applies to tank design yeah. and just about any, anything where there's armor yeah. and mobility involved. And it's the same with armor. The, the Aventail with its, you know, its tough lining is trying to balance the needs of mobility, turn your head, bob your head, nod your head, um, with the need to be, to be safe inside. But it also at the Agincourt period as well, this type of Aventel was being replaced by that new, mm -hmm. the new type mm -hmm. of various mm -hmm. forms of plate gorget yeah. and um, great bassinet that were starting to come in. So mm -hmm. that perhaps what we were talking about previously about um, penetration of plate with arrows, that might have some relevance here because the, the richest and best equipped people may have had plate defences mm -hmm. around there, or did, certainly did some have plate, plate yeah. defences, yeah. whereas the people with the older style bassinets, which weren't very old, but they, mm -hmm. you know, starting to be supplanted in 1415 or by about mm -hmm. 1410, um, 
they may have been more vulnerable to arrows. Um, oh, certainly. Because whilst the mail is fairly good protection against arrows, it's not as good as plate in general. Right. Uh, even with the padding underneath. Yeah. 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 Um, and so the Aventel, the male uh, neck protection, would usually extend pretty much to the tops of the shoulders, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? As a, as a sort of skirt with this fairly rigid padding underneath. Yeah. Um, and that's linked in this case via the, um, how do you say it, vervales? The vervales. The vervales, yeah. yes, I can't pronounce that word. The vervales are the little pierced staples, uh, <laughs> and the, the Aventail itself is sewn to a leather band that, that lays on top of the helmet and is pierced with holes to accept the vervels, and then you run a cord through the whole thing, which means it's easy to strip the thing off, clean it, put it back on, put a different one on. It's a good solution whatever. to yeah. Yes, yeah. So to have a way of removing it. There's a lot of evidence too that these, uh, that the vervels and the cord and the aventail band wouldn't be visible um, when the helmet right. was worn, because they, they were often yeah. originally covered with decorative borders yeah. of metal or whatever. So if you um, look at effigies and brasses, yeah, often yeah, they yeah. have a decorative yeah, bit yeah, around yeah. there. You're not yeah. often actually supposed to see yeah. the vervels and, and, and the cords. And often um, that decoration carries on up over the right, brow, doesn't right, it? Yeah, right, which right. is very rarely done on replicas. Yeah, um, well we're still learning about this yeah. stuff. You know, it's, um, it's important to remember that still the study of armor is a fairly new academic discipline, and yeah. and you know it's always been it's it's been a hard area of study to get going because it's so subsumed with and intermingled with myth and misconception and romance and Arthurian legend and all kinds of things that are distracting you away from mm -hmm. the real material reality of this stuff. And, and, and things that have been written in the past which are frankly wrong. And right. people, have, right. people have repeated what's been said in the past, right. assuming that it's correct, and when they go back and look at the primary source material they realise yeah. that's not correct. Um, a couple of other things I'd just like to point out on this helmet um, uh, is the attachment method. So the visor mm -hmm. um, has these sort of pins at the mm -hmm. side that are attached by little chains. Yeah. That's quite a common feature, isn't it, on bassinets? That's almost universal on bassinets and on great bassinets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it means you can pull two pins and ditch your visor. Yeah, so you just pull um, the pins out the top. Yeah, you so can... once you've gotten through the, you know, the arrows, and you're closing with your enemy and you need more ventilation and more vision for fighting at close quarters, uh, you can eject the visor. Uh, or, or you can, you know, you can have, the, in a lot of the accounts, certainly in the English accounts I've been looking at in the last couple of years, uh, the purchase accounts where an English knight is buying a bassinet from a you know, maker in London or elsewhere, they often say, they often buy a bassinet with two visors. Um, that's, that's, no, that's not an uncommon thing. Now, is that two visors of the same form mm -hmm. so that you have a backup when you've ditched one and you can't find it again? Well, or are they different visors different that do different yeah. things? Yeah. Um, it's, you know, we, can't, we can't say, but this system is a great system. Yeah. You pull those, and for tournament use... It's this is a quick release. It's like a quick yeah. release on a bicycle wheel, isn't it, basically? You can just quickly take yeah. it. Increasingly in modern jousts and tournaments, everybody is going to great bassinets now with multiple visors. So right. they've got their jousting visor, they have their melee on horseback visor, they have their foot combat visor, yeah. and they can have the same skull, same neck plates with three visors, and it, one helmet does everything you need. And, and even today, it's an enormously practical system. And we know that some bassinets had um, a sort of grill uh, visor that we mm -hmm. used in a tournament context mm -hmm. where right. clubs or right. whatever weapons where um, piercing wasn't right. a worry. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think either explanation is plausible, mm -hmm. either having a spare visor mm -hmm. or having a different kind of visor. And the other thing, it, it's patently obvious for anyone who's studied these helmets, but not necessarily for those of you who haven't, that it's very common with all sorts of helmets to have the ventilation breaths on one side and not on the other mm -hmm. for the very simple reason that when you put holes in something you make it weaker um, and oh, right. most right-handed people will strike from the right-handed oh, side yeah. so um, it simply makes it simply keeps the strength of the helmet to the maximum possible whilst increasing ventilation and heat and breathing in helmets is it's a problem, yeah, and and also air exchange. Yeah, you know, there's there's a there's a pocket in there, and you need you need to be able to change out the air mm. that's in there, mm. and you know, if that air gets stale and you can't move the air through fast enough, it becomes mm. a real problem. I mean, I've found many times in jousts and things, 
where I point myself into the wind, mm -hmm. so I get I get breeze coming <laughs> through the sights and exiting out the Na out the ventilation. ventilation yeah. And having a breeze moving past your face is, yeah. is an, an incredible relief. Yeah. One thing also that a lot of people who uh, look at modern recreations of these um, helmets um, may not know is that it's, I believe, unknown to have any sort of device to keep the visor shut right. until you get later into the 15th century. And right. even then it's quite rare. Mm -hmm. um, and whereas if you look at modern helmets made for whether it's SCA or reenactment or, or sort of Battle of the Nations type stuff, Pretty much universally now, people are having a clip or, or at least a strap to keep their visors shut. Mm -hmm. um, my opinion on that is that very often when people got into hand-to-hand -hand combat, they would raise their visor anyway, because you would rather have a bit more vision and breathing capacity mm -hmm. at the loss of a bit of protection. Mm -hmm. What are your? Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know. Yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think. It not, is. not to be not to be too much of a downer on on modern armor making, but I think um, I think a lot of helmets just aren't made enough like the real ones. So the visors are too freely moving, okay. and and we need a clip to hold them up, and we need a clip to hold them down. And the real ones don't have that. Mm -hmm. You know, the real ones, you know, you can achieve a lot with the location and tightness of the pivots. Mm -hmm. You know, the pivots should not be perfectly in line on an axis straight through the middle of the skull. Uh -huh. Most pivots are offset. One really? is higher than the other so that they can be jammed. So it wedges up. And they, wow. the, the fit on the helmets is really specific. Yeah. And if those pivots are in the right place, they're tight enough, uh, and the fit of the visor is good enough on the helmet, I think you know they, they, work, they seem to work perfectly well for the way that they're being used. Yeah. And um, you know it's, it might, after a certain point, be a, be a point of practicality that they just don't they may be very well aware of blocking <coughs> mechanisms, but they just don't want to be bothered with it on the battlefield. You got to do what you need to do, and you can't be fiddling with mechanical, you know, issues like that. And I mean, just bringing a piece of evidence in from the um, historical fighting books in in Fiore's treatise, uh, in the Getty version anyway, and that's, that's certainly in at least a couple of the others. Um, there is a technique where he he's they're fighting in armor and he sort of comes close to someone he wants to stab him in the face mm -hmm. and it says I can't stab you in the face because you have a visor on mm -hmm. so I do this <laughs> pull the mm -hmm. visor up mm -hmm. and then I stab you in the face right. with a pole axe. Right. Um, or you put your hand over the sides and you do something yeah, else. Yeah, of course. And yeah. um, so uh, and there's even grabbing someone by the helmet mm -hmm. uh, sort of behind the visor as it were to yeah. throw them on the ground using it as a point of leverage. Yeah. So I think. Uh, but whereas you look at most of the armoured figures fighting in Fiori, or most of the, or certainly a lot of the medieval treatises, they don't have visors on at all. Mm -hmm. That could be because they're practising techniques or they're yeah. doing so. But I think, certainly if you look at historical artwork, a lot of the time when people are on horse charging into battle or when they're going into arrows, they've got mm -hmm. the visors down. Mm -hmm. And often when they're duking it out with mm -hmm. swords or poleaxes or whatever, they've mm -hmm. got their visors up. Mm -hmm. That could be artistic convention, but I think there's a bit more to it than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, if, there, if it's artistic convention, it's because it's telling a recognisable story. And therefore it has to have some relationship to real world practice. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I mean, it, it, getting it back to Agincourt, I think most of the French, if not all the French, had visors because of the arrow mm -hmm. thing. I think a lot of the English probably had visors too, but perhaps not universally. Mm -hmm. But the design of visors in England, uh, as you'll see in my forthcoming book, um, <laughs> they worked really hard to create a visor that gave you as much vision and ventilation as possible. Right. And one thing you really notice about English armor of this period moving into the middle of the 15th century is they are more heavily armored with plates than just about anybody else. I mean, there are Italian sources that remark on how heavily armored the English are and how much better armored they are than the Italians, which is an interesting thing. So the Italians but were they, probably ahead on the on the metal itself, weren't they? Mm -hmm, probably, the, probably, probably the best quality breastplates and stuff. But in terms of fully encasing the entire yeah. body in steel, the English are way out there. So, so fully enclosed upper cannons, fully enclosed thighs, the backs of the legs. Yeah. They've got long skirts. They've got. They're wearing sabatons universally. Yeah. Um, these are guys who are wearing, you know, if the the guys who are wearing plates on the backs of their legs yeah. are probably going to wear visors yeah. too. Why do you have that complete encasement and then leave the most vulnerable part of your body open? Mm -hmm. It doesn't it doesn't follow. 
and I, and, I, and I think that they, you can of course find evidence of them fighting with open faces, absolutely. I'm not saying they didn't do it, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that there was also a big effort to find design solutions for visors mm -hmm. that work well in, in foot combat as well, also. And just to reiterate um, Toby's point there, that, that conventional German and Italian armors of that period, and from most other areas we know of, would generally the plate on the upper arm were open on the inside, weren't they? So you only had mail there. Whereas the lower arms, um, the van brace was closed, fully closed. Up here it was more like uh, half a tube. The Italian it? ones yeah. only came to about there, and yeah. the whole inside is yeah. open. Generally. And same for German arms. And in fact, if we go even later in the 15th century, some of it is only mm. half a tube, that's right. that, half right. a tube, that's. Right. So the English armour that's absolutely fully enclosed, lower and upper arms, lower and upper legs, mm -hmm. is really. Um, Extreme, isn't mm -hmm. it? And it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the closest comparison in later armor is in um, some, some quite complete tournament armors, isn't it? Yeah. From sort of yeah. like MV8s, fully, right. fully enclosed. But they're, they're designing a special armor for fighting with the poleaxe and the you know, two handed sword on foot. Mm. And so the design brief is very similar to the English war armor of almost 100 years before. Uh, and funnily enough, the English field armors of a hundred years war, a uh, hundred years before, look a lot like those 16th century foot combat. If you're interested in English armor, then uh, Toby's book will be out really soon. Okay, and I'll, I'm sure I'll do a video about that and post links and that kind of stuff. But um, it looks absolutely fascinating, and many of us have been waiting for it for about a decade. I've been working on it for 15 years. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was t started to tell people about it 10 years ago. So finally, uh, just to finish off this video, we have a rare gem that you won't have seen before. Mm -hmm. What is this? Yes, this is a, uh, a skull cap. Um, they're sometimes referred to as cervelliers, um, but it seems that the term cervelier in the original documents refers to a padded textile garment of some kind, possibly the lining for a helmet of some kind. But let's, let's just call it, a, just, just for safety, call it a skull cap for the moment. This is a kind of helmet that was produced in huge numbers uh, and, and uh, distributed to the lower ranking soldiery throughout the 14th and 15th and even into the 16th centuries. Uh, this is absolutely the kind of thing that you would expect English archers to be wearing at Agincourt. And this is, this is a really rare and important piece because generally in museum collections, the things that have survived are the rich and pretty things that people think are worthy of preservation. And, you know, the everyday equipment of ordinary soldiers just doesn't survive in, 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 in very great numbers. So this is a rare one that we've borrowed from a private collection for, especially for the, the Agincourt display. And um, just today, uh, it has been... Um, uh, metallurgically analyzed. You can still see it's got its, uh, its microscope mounting there. We've polished the edge to, uh, to, to look um, microscopically at the metal of this. And this, uh, there's, there, like, like a lot of these things, there's always been questions over this piece's authenticity. Um, but uh, I guess it's, it's a relatively easy thing to fake, isn't it? Until you yeah, look at it at a microscopic yeah. level. It's, and it's a fairly simple object. It's got a number of arrow or crossbow bolts shot through it, and it just seems like the kind of thing that could be faked up to appeal to the romantic imagination of a gullible collector. Um, but I, when I saw this the first time, I was immediately struck by how good the form was. You know, these skull caps are not just round, globular, or hemispherical uh, constructions. The good ones, the real ones, look surprisingly skull-like. Mm. They look like someone is trying to sculpt a model of a human skull in metal. And they are surprisingly close to the human anatomy of the skull. And this one really... Uh, I mean, as, as someone who has... You can see his quite yeah. well. Yeah, you can see and, my skull. Uh, you just hold them up there. <laughs> but also, as you know, I've excavated a fair number of human skulls in my time. Yeah. And, some of them come out of the ground, that very colour, it does literally look, looking at the top of it, looks like a human skull. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the fact that human skulls are slightly narrower at the front than at the back normally, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the way they rise, I mean, I know not everyone's skull is the same shape, but it really is fitted to the head, mm -hmm. it's not just round, yeah. like, a modern, yeah. like most modern replicas. So, so it has a good essential form. You have the feeling that this is a good armour, 
He's got skill, um, but he's having to work quickly because he's making a load of these. He's got to make another 10, 20 by the end of the week. So he can't afford to make sure that the cut of the edge is as nice as it could be. So it's a bit of a hack job. It's not rolled um, edge. Right? Yeah, it's not turned. Yeah. It's, it's basically work the metal until it is usable as a helmet and then stop. Can you stick it on your head? Yes, stop working on it. Yeah, job done. Um, but, um, but I'm very pleased that just today we've analyzed the methyl. And this turns out to be a low carbon, uh, heterogeneous, um, perlite and ferrite uh, steel. Uh, it's exactly the sort of thing we would expect this kind of thing to be made out of at this period. Um, you know, someone's had a go, it's got an Italian mark. Uh, someone's had a go at, at heat treating it. Um, it. The heat treatment hasn't actually done very much because there's not really a whole lot of carbon in it, so there's not much that can happen. Um, but they've had a go at it. it. You know, the material that it's made out of is absolutely consistent um, with what we would expect. The form is absolutely what we would expect, mm -hmm. which we might not expect a faker to be aware of. Um, I think all of these holes are much later. The holes have been... Um, you know, put in at a much later date, uh, and we can we should sort of ignore them. But the piece itself is exactly the sort of thing that the English archers were wearing in large numbers. It's decent protection without undue um, uh, you know effects in terms of you know wearing it. You can still see it's not that heavy. It's cut over the years. You can draw a bow just fine. You know, a helmet like this is much better than no helmet at all. And and that's uh, being able to draw the bow is a very important point, of course, because. Whilst medieval art does often represent archers with forms of sale and kettle hat and things like this on, try drawing a longbow actually with certain types of helmet on and you'll notice for a start most people are used to drawing to their face. You can't get to your face because there's a helmet there now if it comes down there. This actually wouldn't conflict at all. You could just draw completely normally. So for an archer it would be a perfect sort of thing. But they are shown they're shown on sort of billmen and people with halberds mm -hmm. and this sort of sure, stuff sure. as well. They were worn by other soldiers mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And it's got this um, sort of arch over the ears, hasn't it? So mm -hmm. it sits quite low down on the brow. And it's meant to sit very close mm -hmm. to the skull. It would have a lining, but only quite a thin, uh, you know, linen lining. You know, a thin potholder sort mm -hmm. of sort of thickness. So it's to protect from um, cuts and light blows, but probably wouldn't be that great against. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, it's always this trade-off, you know, yeah. you know, how much protection can you afford without, yeah. you know, really compromising the job that you need to be doing, you know, and if, if some knight is coming straight at you with his poleaxe over his head, you should, if you're a respectable soldier, be able to do something about it. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, guys. Well, that's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you to uh, Toby and... Um, these are rare items to see, certainly outside of the glass case, and um, I do have some footage of this being taken out, which I'll tag on to this video. Um, but thanks a lot, Toby, it's been yeah. absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.